Okay, so hello everyone. Um, you are in the tutorial for Docker. Uh, if you're looking for the tutorial on the GitHub, you're in the wrong room. Um, so it looks like uh, several of you were actually to the previous Docker tutorial. Would you mind uh, giving, me, giving me a hand raise if you were in the previous one? In the reactions? I know a couple of you were. All right, not everyone was though, so. Okay, so uh, I just wanna uh, say a few things up front. Um, uh, first of all, this is this is uh, not an advanced Docker tutorial. Uh, this is uh, a, com a complete fresh start to the Docker tutorial. And uh, we only have an hour for this tutorial, so uh, it's gonna go pretty fast. Um, my apologies if, uh, if it's a little too fast. Uh, if I seem to be going too fast, please don't hesitate to interrupt. Uh, we're a pretty small group, so you should feel free to just shout out any questions you have. Uh, and of course, there is the Docker tutorial channel in Slack. So uh, since we're unlikely to cover everything, I would encourage you to go there and ask uh, any questions you have that come up about Docker uh, after the tutorial. All right, so let me give just a second to get my screen set up. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, um, are you all seeing uh, my terminal? You should see pretty much a black screen with some dollar signs in the corner. That look great? Okay, great. So uh, this tutorial is mostly going to just be me live coding in the terminal. Um, and uh, the terminal is the main way you interact with Docker. Uh, and so I'll just kind of be walking through and explaining things here. Um, feel free to follow along. You'll need to have, have Docker installed already uh, if you want to follow along. Um, and just a, a couple of quick notes about, um, about Docker. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm, I'm running on a Mac. Um, I know that not everyone is running on a Mac. Uh, if you are on a Mac, then there should be, uh, if you have Docker running, there should be a little, it's kind of hard to see on my screen, but there's a little uh, icon that looks sort of like a whale with a bunch of boxes on top of it. Um, this is the Docker menu. And if you're not running Docker, then you won't see this in your menu. Uh, I believe there's also a menu item for Linux and Windows, so you should be able to see this if it's running. Um, and there's something a little bit tricky about Docker, which is that it runs as two, uh, two components. One is a server that's always running in the background on your computer. Um, and it's run by root, meaning it has uh, access to everything on your computer, all the hardware, all the files and everything. And then there's also a client, which is the command line that we actually interact with. So when we type a command to Docker, what happens is the client connects to the server tells it what the command we typed was, and then, then, then the server processes it. And so this little icon uh, represents uh, the Docker server as opposed to the Docker uh, uh, client. So um, if, you have, if you don't have the Docker server running, uh, you're gonna have some trouble following along. Um, and the easiest way to start it is just to, uh, on a Mac is just to search for Docker. And if you run this Docker app, it'll start up your Docker server. Uh, on Windows, you may have to use the start menu or something like that, but it'll be similar. All right. Um, so uh, for starters, we're going to need a few files for this tutorial. And uh, let me go ahead and put the uh, website that um, has this tutorial in the Slack. It's already in the Slack, but I'll put it in there so uh, it's a little easier to see or to find. Um, sorry, my Slack is just a little slow. Uh, Okay, I just posted in Slack the uh, the website that for that has the material we're going to be following, um, and the first item on this uh, this website in the schedule is the setup. Uh, this it can, contains instructions on how to install Docker. Um, I'm not going to go through those now because it'll take too long to install it uh, right now, but um, uh, there is also a file to download here called Docker Intro.zip. I'm going to go ahead and just click on it to download it. And uh, then I'm going to go to my terminal. Um, now, I happen to be in my desktop uh, directory right now, uh, which is where I'm going to be doing uh, most of the, stuff, the Docker stuff. Um, I'm on Mac, so I'm going to move uh, that file I just downloaded from my downloads directory, uh, docker intro.zip, into my desktop. And then I'm just going to unzip it. Uh, and you should have a command unzip whether you're on Linux or uh, Mac or uh, Windows. Uh, so hopefully that works. Um, if not, feel free to shout out and we can try to debug it. 
Um, and I'm going to go ahead and change directory into that Docker intro uh, directory, and I'm just kind of working here. Okay. So um, first of all, let's go ahead and just do our first Docker command just to kind of test that everything is working. Um, and we can just say docker dash dash version. This will just give us the version of the Docker uh, uh, system that we've installed. Um, this doesn't actually even need to connect to the server. So if you're not running the server, but you have installed Docker, this should still work. Um, that just kind of demonstrates the Docker command. We'll be using this Docker command for pretty much everything we do with Docker. Oops. One second. All right. So uh, this this command just told us the uh, the version of Docker we're running, but a somewhat more interesting command might be to list what are called Docker containers. Um, so to do this, and again, this is just a test, and this will test that we're actually connecting to a server that's running. Uh, we can type Docker container list. Uh, and what you can see here is it gives us uh, what looks like the top of a table of information, um, uh, but uh, without any actual entries in the, in the uh, table. Um, this, uh, this command actually also has a shortcut, which is docker container ls, uh, just kind of like the ls command for, for Linux, and it does the exact same thing. Apologies, I'm getting a bunch of Slack messages. Let me just one second. Uh, sorry, my Slack just crashed. It looked like someone had asked a question uh, in the channel. Um, so yeah, that, you asked a question. You can ignore it. That was me. My Wi-Fi cut out. I was just asking where to find the, the zip file, but I got it now. Oh, gotcha. OK, great. OK. Um, so there's uh, a, uh, an important concept in Docker, which is the difference between what's called a container, a Docker container, and a Docker image. Um, the concept of a Docker container, which is uh, the main unit of what we are going to be running with Docker, uh, comes actually from the concept, concept of a shipping container. So back before shipping containers were standardized for transport across the ocean, uh, it was actually very expensive and difficult to plan out how a ship was going to fit all of its cargo in place. Uh, when shipping containers became very standardized internationally uh, and the notion of a shipping pallet became standardized, it became much easier for sh uh, shippers to calculate costs and space and stuff, and it drastically uh, increased the efficiency of shipping. The idea of Docker is kind of similar, but of course we're not shipping things, uh, we're running things. And uh, the idea behind a Docker container is that the container itself is uh, essentially a virtual machine that's running uh, on your computer somewhere in the background. Um, and uh, everything inside the container is sort of is containerized, is, uh, is separated from the rest of your operating system and uh, has its own sort of set of files and file system and, and libraries and things that are installed. And uh, the difference between a Docker container and a Docker image is that a container is a virtual machine uh, with a file system and everything that is running on your computer, while a, a Docker image is essentially a blueprint of that container that can be used to start up a container. So uh, if you have a Docker image of something, like for example, if we have a Docker image of the Ubuntu Linux operating system, uh, we can start it up uh, as a container, and then we can interact with that container as if it were like a separate machine running Ubuntu. The image itself is just the blueprint, so it can't be it, it can't be run per se. It can just be converted into a container to run, and that's the source of a lot of confusion. So I just wanted to explain that up, up front. Um, so uh, we looked at Docker contain, uh, container ls. Um, there's a similar uh, command called Docker image ls, and that just tells us all the images we have available on our system. Uh, and once again, we're going to get, uh, uh, assuming you haven't been using Docker uh, before this tutorial, you'll get a uh, list that looks sort of like the header of a table, but that doesn't contain uh, very much actual information. Uh, this is basically, oh yeah, go ahead. So can you, um, is it possible to have a container without an image or do all containers have an image? Uh, so in a, in a sense, it is possible to have a container without an image, but typically, uh, at least in theory, but realistically, uh, you always start a container from an image of the operating system. So um, 
while it's while it's possible to have a container running on your computer that doesn't have an image associated with it, uh, that because you've, for example, modified a container, um, you typically you typically won't have a container that didn't at some point come from an image. Uh, starting from starting an empty container is is uh, uh, not something I know how to do personally, um, and it would require you to install the operating system inside the container somehow. So it's not not something you ever really encounter in Docker. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, basically what this is telling us is that we don't have any containers and we don't have any images currently uh, ready to go on our system. Uh, so let's start out by getting an image. Um, Docker is uh, set up to work a little bit like Git. Um, it is definitely not Git and it's not really all that similar, but there are some similarities in the commands. Um, and Docker works with a website called Docker Hub. That's hub.docker.com. Um, I encourage you to go there and check out the, uh, the interface there. Uh, you can search it for Docker images that are currently available for download. Um, if we had more time, I would show you some of this, but uh, since we have a short lesson today, we're not gonna actually go to the website. Um, but one of the really neat things about Docker is you can use the Docker command line to pull images down from Docker Hub by name. So for just an example to start with, we're gonna use the Docker pull command and do Docker pull, Hello world. Hello world is just the name of a, a Docker image that's maintained by uh, Docker officially. So when we uh, when we type this, we'll get a bit of output. Um, uh, I'll explain what some of this means uh, as we go, but uh, the basic idea is that it's uh, it's connecting to Docker Hub, downloading the Docker image, and then uh, printing some stats about it. Now, if I type ls, um, you'll notice. There's this directory basic and this directory sum. Those are both already here. Uh, so what you can see is that we didn't just download a file into the file system when we when we pulled from Docker. Rather, what we did uh, was we told the Docker server to go grab the image and keep track of it for us. So uh, the Docker server in the background keeps track of all of your images, and you don't have to worry about where they are in the file system. Um, they're just kind of handled for you. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so um, now if we type Docker image ls, we should see that we have a hello world uh, image here. Uh, we see that it's it's called hello world. Repository is just the name of the uh, uh, the Docker image in this case. Um, it has what's called a tag. Tag is basically a version number, um, and in this case, the tag is is latest. Now I, I said version number, but it's really a string, so it doesn't have to be a literal number, but um, this basically just says that the this is the latest version of the uh, the Hello World Docker image. Um, there's an image ID, which is sort of a unique identifier for this particular Docker image, and some uh, metadata about it. Um, so we have an image we've downloaded, but uh, if we look at our container uh, list, we can see that we still don't have any containers, and that's because we haven't started this image. So that's the next thing we'll do. We'll go ahead and use the command docker run. So the command docker run uh, takes an image and it starts it up as a container and runs it. Um, now, uh, there are multiple ways that Docker uh, containers get run. Sometimes they you uh, take an image and you turn it into a container and it runs like a server and it just keeps running for a long time and you don't really interact with it. Um, other times, and I find this is much more common in scientific software, um, the idea behind the Docker image is that uh, uh, you, you uh, um, you start up the, the image as a container, and it runs through some like analysis pipeline or some script you've, you've embedded inside the container, and then it exits and gives you the answer. Um, and that's what this particular container is going to do. It's just going to run and, and exit. So what we do is we just type docker, docker run, hello world, and push enter. And this may take a second because Docker needs to start up a whole operating system, but it will eventually print this message. Uh, so hello from Docker. This message shows that your installation appears to be working correctly. To generate this message, Docker took the following steps. First, it connected it, the Docker client, contacted the Docker daemon. The Docker daemon is the name of the server uh, that I mentioned, the Docker server that's running in the background. It's called the Docker daemon. Um, the Docker daemon pulled the hello image, uh, hello world image from Docker Hub. Actually, it didn't do that in this step because we did that in the previous step. But had we not pulled the hello world uh, Docker image, uh, Docker would have pulled it for us. It automatically will pull it if it doesn't know where it is, um, assuming it's a real named image. Uh, after that, the Docker daemon created a new container uh, from the image. 
and uh, it runs the executable um, that produces this output. And uh, then the Docker daemon or the Docker server sent that output back to the client, which we uh, used to interact with, uh, with Docker. And uh, the client printed out to the, the terminal. Um, so uh, that, uh, that's basically what happened. Um, it's a slightly complicated process, but from our perspective, we just said Docker run hello world and we, it printed a message. So um, that's a very simple kind of uh, initial overview to the Docker command. Um, but uh, obviously this is not a very useful Docker command. It's just sort of a demo. Uh, so uh, let's try something a little bit more interesting. Now you notice here that it says, maybe we want to try something more ambitious like Docker run. And then there's some option here, Ubuntu bash. Uh, that's a great thing to try at some point, but in this tutorial, we're not going to do it because uh, Ubuntu is a big operating system. It's several gigabytes and it would take us a while to download that Docker image. So instead of using Ubuntu, we're going to use a very minimal Docker image called Alpine, which is just another flavor of Linux. Um, it's, but instead of being gigabytes, it's, it's just a few megabytes. So uh, I'm going to use that same command, docker run dash it Alpine. The dash it here uh, is an option to the docker run command that basically just says, uh, I want you to do this interactively. So I want to be able to type things and have it go to the, the Docker container. And I want the Docker container to print things back to me. Um, that's, you'll, you'll see this a lot. You put it after almost every run command in, in my experience. So let's go ahead and run this. OK, so it told us it couldn't find uh, Alpine locally. So it's going to go ahead and pull it. And here it is, pulling and extracting. This will take just a second. Okay, it's done. It's downloaded a new image, and here we are. Um, so basically, what this has done is it's given us a different prompt. It looks like so. Uh, previously, my prompt was a dollar sign. Now it's a slash followed by a pound sign. The reason for that is because I'm no longer typing into my terminal. I'm typing now into the Docker container. Uh, so, if for example I type ls. I see what looks like the contents of uh, the root of a Linux server. Um, if I type pwd, you can see that I'm in the, the root directory. Uh, if I type who am I, you can see that I'm root. Um, that's because when I start up this, uh, this Docker container, uh, it assumes I'm going to want to log in as root because uh, I'm the only one who has access to it. And so um, I should probably be uh, installing things or something like that. OK. Any questions so far? I know we're going a little fast, so please uh, please ask if you have questions. So would Docker work if you want to just um, patch into your local server? Uh, if you were just like, if you just logged in to a local server, would it still work? Yeah, so would could like do other Docker images for that? Like a server where your data is kept? So, okay. Um, so there are ways to store data in Docker and uh, have the data be inside of a Docker image, um, okay. but I don't I don't usually recommend those. Uh, I think it's usually, especially for scientific workflows, it's usually easiest to have your data on like a shared network drive or something like that, and for your Docker containers to be able to find that data. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that said, you can absolutely have a Docker server that runs like an SSH server or that runs something uh, that you can log into, um, a web server. Uh, that's, that's actually quite common. Um, it's just not as common in uh, scientific uh, computing workflows. Uh, in Rather. So the only way I can get, I, I, the easiest way for me to give access to that data is just to SSH into that server when I'm inside this container, pretty much. Uh, yeah, although okay. you can also mount it in, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll cover a few more topics, and then we'll get to uh, volume mounting. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, Sorry, just a, just a small question. Was the difference mm -hmm. between using bash and not using bash in the Ubuntu command that they recommend? Uh, so um, uh, basically, if you put if you put bash here, you're telling Ubuntu that you want it to run bash when it starts. Um, but uh, there are ways to design a Docker container so that um, it, uh, it, it automatically starts up something when, when you don't provide it with a command to start. And that's the case with Alpine. Um, so I could have put bash at the end and it would have done the exact same thing. 
Um, basically, the Alpine Docker knows that if you start it without uh, a command to run at the end, it'll just start up uh, Bash by itself. Thank you. OK, so um, I'm inside this Docker, uh, but maybe I'm ready to, to exit the Docker. So I'm going to go ahead and type exit. Um, and that brings me back to my uh, previous prompt. Uh, so uh, I'm back in my own terminal. Uh, one second. OK, so let's go ahead and see now. Um, uh, we looked and saw that we now have an image that we downloaded, but we also just ran a container. So maybe we have a container. And now we can see that there's an Alpine uh, image as well. So we can run Docker container ls. And somewhat curiously, uh, we don't have any containers. Um, so that seems maybe a little bit uh, a little bit strange. Um, but uh, the reason for this uh, has to do with how Docker handles containers and what it thinks you're asking for when you ask it to list them. So if I were to instead say Docker container ls and then provide this optional uh, uh, option dash dash all, what I'm basically saying is show me all the containers, uh, not just the ones that are currently running. When you do Docker container ls or Docker container list, it assumes you just want to see the containers that are currently running. But since we we opened up this container, did a few things, and then exited, um, it assumed we were finished, and it closed the container down, um, and the container is no longer running. So although uh, we, we used that container and had it running for a little bit, uh, Docker shut it down at the end. And uh, so it's considered a stopped container. Uh, when we do Docker container ls all, we see that they're uh, the, both of these containers that we ran. Um, and uh, it knows about when they exited. Um, uh, and uh, uh, they're just kind of sitting around as stopped containers now. Um, we'll come back to those in a minute. I just want to point out that if we now run a new version of uh, the Alpine container, we'll just start a new one. And I'll do it with Bash this time just to kind of demonstrate. Um, Ah, OK, uh, my mistake. In Alpine, it's called sh, not bash. Uh, same thing, uh, bash is just sometimes called sh, uh, short for shell. Uh, but same idea. You can't, you can't run bash in Alpine because it's not called bash in Alpine, but um, you can run sh in that world of bash. So uh, here we, we land once again inside of this Docker container. And you might assume that this is actually the same container that we stopped. Uh, that would seem to make sense. Uh, but just to kind of demonstrate that it's not, I'm going to make a file um, called temp.txt here in the root directory, and we can see it right here. Uh, and then I'm going to exit. And then I'm going to run the exact same command we just ran and start the container back up again. And uh, once we get inside of this container, if I run ls, you can see that that temp.txt file is gone. Um, that's because every time we run this command, docker run uh, dash it alpine sh, uh, we actually start a new container entirely from the Docker image. So let me exit. And uh, if we do Docker container ls now, we'll see that, uh, oh, whoops, uh, Docker container ls dash dash all. Uh, we'll see that there are now multiple Alpine containers, one for each, uh, each container we started running. OK, any questions about that? So is there a way to go back to the previous container, or is it lost forever? Uh, so no, the container, no, the containers are lost. Um, uh, there are ways to restart the containers. Uh, um, they, they, that wasn't something I was planning on covering uh, in this uh, in this uh, lecture. Um, I believe the command is uh, Docker restart. It's Docker accept, I think. Sorry? Docker accept, exec, like execute. Uh, so Docker exec, I believe, is used when you've got a Docker that's already running um, and you want to execute something inside of it. Uh, although uh, this that's not a command that I use very often, so it's possible that I'm, I'm mistaken about exactly how it's used. Um, 
I am fairly sure that you can uh, restart containers with the Docker restart command, uh, stop containers, that is. Um, uh, but this is kind of beyond the scope of the tutorial. So I'd suggest uh, going to the, the Docker web pages and looking at the help there about this command. Um, rather than teach you how to restart the containers, I'm going to teach you how to, to delete the used containers, however. And part of the reason that I'm, I'm setting things up this way is because uh, the most common way that we use Dockers in scientific software uh, and scientific workflows is that we've packaged an entire workflow, like for example, the whole fMRI prep pipeline inside of a Docker container so that you don't have to worry about installing very, the various Python libraries and having all the right versions of all the software that it uses uh, when you want to run the fMRI prep pipeline. Um, and for that purpose, what we'll usually do is we'll just have uh, the Docker run and run all the way through the pipeline and then exit, and then we'll be done with it. And when we want, want to run uh, the fMRI prep pipeline on a new subject, we'll just run a new uh, container entirely. Um, so usually we don't restart containers uh, very often. We usually just let them run and then and then clean them up. Uh, so um, okay, so uh, let's talk about uh, removing images and containers. Um, if we do a Docker image ls, we'll see these these images. And let's suppose we want to uh, delete the hello world image from our computer. Um, so we don't know where the files for the hello world image are kept because uh, uh, Docker, the Docker server takes care of that for us. Um, so we instead use a command, which is docker image rm for remove, uh, and it will remove hello world. Um, now, you can remove these Dockers by their repository name. Uh, you can also do repository name colon tag, like uh, hello world colon latest. Uh, typically, people recommend that you instead copy the image ID and paste it down here, and that helps uh, when you have multiple um, when you have multiple images that have the same name but different tags. Uh, this helps keep you from accidentally deleting the wrong one. So uh, I'll go ahead and Docker image rm, and when I do this, we're going to get an error: uh, unable to delete this Docker uh, image is being used by stopped container with this ID. So uh, looking back up at our uh, Docker container list, uh, we can find that ID. Uh, I think it's this one. Um, and we can see that this is a stopped uh, container that was started using the, uh, sorry, it's this one, stopped container that was started using the hello world Docker image. So what this is basically saying is that you can't delete this image because there's a container that's still using it or that's based on it. Um, even though this container stopped, we got to get rid of the container first. So um, not surprisingly, we can use the Docker container rm command, and we can copy this container ID, uh, paste it down here, and that should help let us uh, delete that container. Uh, if we now do a Docker container ls dash dash all, we'll see that uh, that hello world uh, container is gone. So I can now uh, Docker image rm and grab that image ID again and paste it here. And uh, now this should work. And it says that we've deleted some stuff. Uh, and if you do a Docker image LS, we'll see that we no longer have that hello world image uh, staying around. So um, that's how you can delete containers and images. Um, often, however, uh, we know going in that we're going to want to delete a container when we're done running it. So um, there's a, a way to do that automatically without having to run the, the RM command. So for that, we do uh, docker run, and we're going to pass that dash it, uh, and then we're going to pass a dash dash rm uh, command. Uh, and uh, the dash dash rm uh, option uh, basically says that when, when you're done with this container, once, once it exits, uh, just delete it right away. I don't want you to keep it around. Um, so if I run alpine sh, uh, this will start it up normally. Uh, in here in the Docker, and then when I exit, um, what we should see is that when we look at the container list, there's still only uh, four Alpines from the previous four times we ran it. And there won't be a fifth Alpine. <laughs> All right. Uh, any questions so far? You okay. kind of talked about how um, the entire like fMRI prep pipeline can be inside one container. So if we were to run it using that container, where would that data output get saved? That's a great question. And uh, we will talk about that, I promise. Um, 
they will probably be about the last thing we get to, but uh, we're gonna start by building our own Docker uh, image first. Okay. So um, so uh, what uh, what we'll do is we'll build a Docker image um, and then we'll uh, we'll demonstrate. Actually, actually, um, uh, actually, I think I'll, uh, given the amount of time we have, I, 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 I've changed my mind. I think we'll go ahead and cover this now. So um, to answer your question, let's suppose that uh, I'm, I'm sitting here in this directory and there's some stuff in this sum directory that I want to make sure I have access to when I'm running my Docker. And I wanna be able to write out some output that is saved uh, in my local file system in the sum directory. So uh, for this, we're gonna use the Docker run command again. I'm gonna say dash IT uh, and dash dash RM, just like we did before. Uh, but I'm going to add uh, I'm going to add one more command line option, and this is dash b. Uh, dash b stands for volume. Uh, volumes typically refer to like if you're if you're accessing uh, the drive of another computer over the network, that's called mounting a network volume. Uh, volume just refers to like a piece of a file system or uh, something like that. Um, so what it means for the Docker run command is that we have some a bit of a file system that's on our local computer. And we want to make sure that the the uh, whatever's running inside the Docker container has access to that piece of the file system, that volume. So uh, the way that uh, we do this, I'm going to say um, uh, the volume that I want to include inside the Docker from my local machine is dollar sign pwd slash sum. Now uh, dollar sign pwd. Uh, if you're on uh, if you're on Windows, I think you probably if you're in PowerShell, I think you need to use a lowercase pwd. Uh, but the basic idea is PWD stands for, uh, 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 no, I'm not sure what the P is for offhand, but it's, for, it's your working directory. Um, basically, it's whatever directory you're currently in. And uh, this dollar sign uh, PWD will get replaced with the, the name of the current directory. Um, and after the directory name, I'm going to put a colon. And then I'm going to put slash local uh, data. Uh, and then I'm going to put Alpine SH again. So uh, what, what this is doing is it's saying to run this Alpine uh, Docker, run it interactively, clean it up when uh, we're done running it, and make sure that while we're running it, the directory slash local data inside of the Docker container uh, is basically just a mirror of the current directory slash sum. Um, so let's go ahead and run that. This will take just a second, of course, and start up the, uh, the Docker container. OK, so now we're inside of the Docker container. And if we type ls, we can see that there's a directory here called local data. Uh, that's the directory we, uh, we created. And if we look inside of local data, we can see that there's a file here called Docker file and a file called sum.py. These were both uh, uh, in the, the directory to start with. Uh, we didn't look in that directory yet, but uh, you'll just have to trust me for now. If I just cat um, local data uh, slash sum.py, uh, we can see that this contains a very simple uh, Python script uh, that just takes a bunch of integers from the command line and sums them up. Um, and uh, let me go ahead and cd into local data. Uh, and uh, I'm going to just create a file. Um, this is a test string. I'm going to dump that string into a file named testfile.txt. So we can now see that inside of this sum directory, there's now a Docker file, sum.py, and testfile.txt. Uh, and now I'm just going to exit out of the Docker container. And I'm going to look inside of that, that, uh, look, that uh, sum directory uh, that's just in my file system. And what we should see is that the testfile.txt is, uh, is there. So um, we can now cat sum slash test file.txt and see that it contains the string we put there. So uh, um, this is basically a method for uh, uh, taking data on your local computer and allowing the Docker to have the Docker container to have access to it and vice versa. So, uh, any questions about that? Yeah. Um, so because the container is loaded onto your local machine, even though it's like been brought in from somewhere else. Am I correct in my thinking that when you say it's mirrored your local files, it's actually just pointing directly at your files. There's not like an upload download time there. Correct. 
Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, it's that's and that's actually very important because these are not copies. If you if you mount something inside of your Docker and you delete all of it, it will delete it all on your computer. So uh, just be very careful with your volumes. Don't uh, don't go off writing things into them that if you don't really know what they are or something like that. Um, there's also a, a bunch of uh, security stuff. I see your question. Just one second. Um, there's a bunch of security stuff that we're not going to talk about. Um, uh, because we won't have time today, but uh, there are some rules about what directories you can and can't mount into a Docker that have to do with the fact that the Docker uh, server is running as root, and so you aren't allowed to basically mount anything that's not one of your directories, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so you'll you'll encounter those. There's a lot of reading online about it. Um, unfortunately, we won't have time to go into it uh, today. Um, and then I I think uh, Ben, I think you had a question. Yeah, super quickly, just to help me remember. Mm -hmm what this all means. What does the V stand for again? Uh, the dash V stands for volume, um, okay. which just a uh, volume is just a term for like a, a piece of a file system or a, a, a like a, a network drive or something like that. Um, it's it's commonly used when we're talking about uh, mounting pieces of data between virtual machines or network machines or something like that. Okay. And you can point, I mean, you can point as big or as little of a, you know, file structure as you want, or even just one yeah. file, I guess. Yep, absolutely. You can. You don't have to do a directory. You can actually just put a single file inside of the Docker if you want. Uh, you can put uh, tons and tons of data. There's not really a limit since it's just pointing at your uh, local machine. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, whew, this is this session sure goes fast with just an hour. Okay, we're going to uh, we're going to move right along now and uh, go ahead and uh, create our own uh, Docker. So I'm going to start by going into the sum directory. Um, now, in this directory, we, we already saw there was a, a file sum.py. Uh, we're just going to, this This is just like a Python script. It's an example of Python script. Uh, it, it's not really a, a neuroscience workflow, but we're going to pretend like there's a, a complicated, difficult to install neuroscience workflow that's uh, inside of sum.py. And what we need to do is uh, have get a, build a Docker image that can be run as a container that already contains all of the uh, uh, libraries and, and uh, uh, programs and stuff that we need in order to execute sum.py inside of the Docker. So to build our own Docker image, uh, we use what is called a Docker file. Docker files always start with a capital D, are named Docker file, um, and they always sit inside of a directory that contains everything necessary to build the Docker uh, in it. So um, I'm going to edit this Docker file using a program called Nano. Uh, most terminals should have Nano installed. Uh, you can use your own text editor. It's just a text file, um, but I'm going to use Nano. So I'm going to edit this uh, Docker file. And there's a few lines that have kind of been pre-propagated here. So um, let's separate these out a bit. Uh, almost every Docker uh, file starts with a line from. Uh, this from is a command for the Docker uh, Docker builder that uh, tells it that this Docker that we're building is going to be based on some other Docker image, and we just put its name in the from Docker. So uh, we're going to base this one on the Alpine uh, the Alpine Linux distribution we've been looking at. Um, you can put a tag here if you want. If you don't put one, it's going to assume you mean latest. Um, so we'll just say Alpine colon latest. Um, and then uh, uh, just a note real quick is that you can put comments, um, you can put comments that are uh, uh, prefaced by a hashtag just like in Python and the Docker uh, builder will ignore those. Uh, so these next couple lines are run lines and basically all these do is they tell uh, Docker to during the build process, run this command uh, inside of, uh, of, of the Docker container as you're building it. Uh, and um, it's just as simple as, uh, whoops, uh, well, I didn't mean to delete that, but that's okay. Um, uh, it's just as simple as uh, basically typing uh, whatever uh, shell command you want the Docker to run as part of the, the build process. So uh, as an example, our Alpine uh, Linux system doesn't have Python installed inside of it. So we're going to need to install Python uh, in order for this to work. Uh, so. Hopefully, I have the right command here. In Alpine, I believe the uh, command is apk add dash dash update. And then we list the packages we want to install. So Python 3, pip 3, uh, sorry, py3 dash pip and Python 3 dash dev. 
Um, this is just a command. Uh, we could we could uh, start up the Alpine Docker and run it, and it would install Python three inside of that Docker image. And uh, putting it after this this run command will do exactly that. So assuming that that um, that command uh, runs successfully, we might then want to say something like run, uh, and we installed pip here in this command. So now we can run pip three install, uh, and then you know we can install whatever dependencies we needed to install. So maybe we need to install numpy and uh, scikit learn or something like that. Uh, I'm 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 going to uh, comment out this line because we don't actually want to install those today. Uh, but the idea here is just that you usually have many run commands uh, in your Docker file, and they start by installing basic utilities um, like Python. Uh, they you might also uh, very frequently want to uh, uh, install Git um, because you may want to Git a GitHub repository and. Uh, have that inside the Docker, uh, especially if you're trying to package up a library that you've written in a GitHub repository into a Docker for other people to use. Um, again, we're not going to install that because we don't need it for this, uh, but just to give you kind of an idea of what these commands do. Um, anything that you can run inside of the Docker, you can run in a run command. Uh, and then the final thing uh, is this command line. And the command line just tells uh, the, the Docker builder what you would like it to do by default if nobody provides, uh, if, if the person doesn't provide uh, arguments at the end of, of, of the Docker run command. Uh, so uh, in our case, uh, we would basically want to run that, uh, that sum script. So um, uh, we'll say uh, Python 3. And this command uh, uh, has a kind of funny syntax. I'll explain it in just a second. Uh, Python 3, uh, um, and then uh, sum.py. And then we want to provide a few uh, arguments, uh, 10, 11, 12. So um, this is a kind of weird syntax for providing a default command. Uh, the way it works is that you provide a list uh, uh, demarcated by square brackets of strings, where the strings are each surrounded by double quotes. And uh, each string is like a different word of the, of the command. So um, this basically boils down to a command that's just Python 3 sum.py 10, 11, 12. Uh, but you put it like this because it's uh, easier for the Docker uh, uh, daemon to process. Um, so I'm going to write this out. Uh, control O to write, and then Control X to exit. Now. Um, there is a problem with that Docker file, and I will get to it in just a second, but you might have noticed it yourself. Um, however, uh, for now, we're just going to go ahead and build the Docker. So to build a Docker image, we use the command docker build. We give it the argument dash t for tag, which tells it what we want to name this Docker. Um, I'm going to name this Alpine sum. Uh, and then uh, we give it the directory that contains the Docker file that we want to build. Uh, not the Docker file itself, we give it the directory containing. So we go ahead and uh, build this directory. So this will take a, a second, uh, but basically it's going to give us a bunch of messages as it uh, uh, builds this Docker, runs the uh, um, APK command to install Python. And uh, it's got some kind of fancy terminal uh, printing for showing us uh, this command. This is actually running inside of a sort of pseudo Docker container right now as the image gets built. Um, and one of the nice things about this build command is that uh, suppose we realize that there's a mistake and we will realize there's a mistake in this Docker file. And then we go back and we add some lines to fix it. Um, assuming that we didn't change the first few lines of the Docker file, this Docker build system will remember what it did for those first few lines and it will skip all of that processing on the second run and just use what it had before. So it's it's very smart about caching your progress uh, as you're building things and making images. Um, and we'll see that when we when we correct the Docker file and run this again, we'll see that it uh, uh, builds without having to run all of these commands and, and take this about a minute of uh, installation. For now, it's just about finished. Um, it's just basically saving the image out. Any questions while we wait for this to build? All right. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my question is, um, how is it different in the command command that you wrote in Docker file? How is that 
different than the run command where it looks like you're you're typing you know essentially the same thing which is telling docker to do something yeah. at default startup but without the funny quotes syntax so um the uh the run the run uh command in the docker file is specifically things to run during uh the building of the docker image the command is the thing to run when someone turns the docker image into the container and runs it so i know those are kind of uh, ambiguous names um and a little bit confusing but uh that's the basic idea and there's there's actually another variant of command called entry point. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to talk about it today, but uh, I would suggest looking it up. It will let you uh, define something kind of like a command uh, that's similar. Um, if you okay. specify a command, but then somebody puts something else at the end, that'll run instead? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so the, actually the main difference between command and entry point is that if you specify an entry point, that always gets used, and anything they add to the end will get appended to the entry point. Um, whereas the command is is like what it what it considers you to have typed at the end of the Docker run command. Uh, if if the the person who runs it doesn't add any extra arguments, so uh, let's go ahead and now try to run this uh, Docker that we built. Um, we can do Docker run dash it dash dash rm, and then the name of the Docker was Alpine Sum. So we'll go ahead and run that. And we should get an error. Yeah. So basically, it's saying it can't find sum.py. And the reason for that is because sum.py is in this directory, but that's not inside of the Docker. So there's a couple ways we could fix this. One is we could use this exact same command, and we could do dash b, and we could say dollar sign pwd slash sum.py. Uh, and we're going to mount that inside of slash sum.py inside of the Docker. Then when the Docker uh, tries to run that command, that sum.py file will be there inside of the Docker and it'll find it, it should be fine. Uh, and there we have it. The sum of 10, 11, and 12 is 33. However, um, that's a kind of clunky way to put a file inside of the Docker, especially when this is this, this is our representation of the script that we want to encapsulate inside the Docker. So let's go ahead and edit our Docker file again. Uh, and we're going to add a new line here. And this line's command is copy. And what the copy command does is it copies things from your local file system into the Docker image uh, where they get stored permanently as copies. So these do not uh, mount things. They don't, if you change the file inside of the Docker image after you've copied it, it doesn't change the original file. This is an actual copy. And what we want to do is we want to add sum.py, which has to be in our current directory, uh, the directory we build the Docker from. And we want to add it to slash sum.py inside the Docker. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and save this with Control O and then push Control X to exit out. And then we're going to build this again. Again, I'm going to give it the tag alpine sum. And uh, uh, I'm going to build out of this directory. And this time that we build it, uh, it's not going to have to run that installation because uh, it's going to remember it from last time. So this should be pretty fast. There, already done. Uh, so uh, basically, because we really all the only change we made to the Docker we built last time was we added one more file, the sum.py. It used basically everything from the last Docker we built and just added that one additional change. So it's quite efficient. Uh, now, if we do Docker run uh, dash it dash dash rm uh, alpine sum. It should be able to run all by itself without that uh, sum.py mounted into it. And it does take a second to start up that OS, but once it does, we get the, uh, uh, the uh, sum 33. OK, so we are about at the end of the time. Uh, I apologize that we didn't get through all that much. Um, I would encourage you to go back and look at the uh, uh, that link I posted, um, which contains uh, a full tutorial about Docker, um, including a lot more material than what we just covered. Uh, these are the very bare bone basics. Uh, I'd be happy to stick around and answer questions for a little bit longer. Um, but uh, I anticipate that we'll be heading over to the uh, the other uh, room in a few minutes. So um, uh, I'll need to shut this down, this room down then. But for now, if you have any questions, uh, please ask away. All right. So I lost you just a little bit at the end, which is fine. I'll go back and look at it. But I, I did have a question. So does it ever so because it only points to files and doesn't really copy them, if you have 
your own data mounted on your local computer, you can just point mm -hmm. to that mount point, right? You can just, and then it'll be able to access the data inside that. That's correct, yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah. That's great to know. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just, I guess, the super basic question. I noticed that I would get an error if I put a, if I tried to put a comment after a line, like after a copy line, whereas uh, it, isn't an error with other lines? It, it, do you have like a quick explanation for what's going on? Yeah. So if you put a comment at the end of a run line, um, uh, Bash accepts comments. So you can actually put a comment at the end of any line in Bash. So when the run command takes that whole line and feeds it to Bash, Bash just ignores the comment for you. Uh, in the copy command, um, the Docker files aren't that sophisticated. You can only put comments on lines by themselves. So um, the copy command gets confused. But gotcha. uh, that's the basic idea. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'd be happy to add some more questions in the Docker tutorial uh, uh, Slack channel. Um, I know there's a lot more to Docker, and uh, um, there's a, there's a lot of questions you may have. Feel feel free to ask. Um, but for now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and close the room, and I'll see you all at the next session.